Hello there everybody, Mr. Wilson here again for part 6 of going through this GCSE Further Maths, um, November 2021, uh, paper 2 by AQA. So um, if you haven't seen already, we've gone through um, all the other questions up to question 15. So today we're starting on question 16 and actually just looking at this question now, it's one of my favourite topics in maths. So... The coefficient of x to the power 4 in the expansion of a plus 2x to the power 6 is 1,500. Work out the two possible values of a. Now, whenever you, I'm looking at something like this, and I see a bracket raised to quite a large power, right, in this case 6, I know it's not really going to involve expanding these brackets using the normal method, right? Because if you were expanding double brackets, you might use a little grid, um, obviously bigger than this, so you can actually fit some numbers in, but I'm just illustrating here. And you would write one of the brackets across the top, you might write one of the brackets down the side, and then you expand the brackets like that. And if you were doing triple brackets, you might still use the same method, um, but you need to incorporate the third bracket into this expansion. However, for three marks, they're not going to make you expand six brackets like this that would be absolutely ridiculous so there has to be a, an easier way of doing it and this easier way is the binomial uh, theorem or the binomial expansion um, which is going to help us solve this now I've actually done a whole separate video on the binomial theorem just because um, there are students that I've taught in the in the past who, who find this quite a difficult topic I mean it is on a level math so it's not exactly like it's the easiest topic in the world and and if you're seeing it for the first time it can be quite difficult to understand so I'm just going to sort of loosely cover a few basics but I would highly recommend if, if this is one of the topics you struggle on go watch that video I'll try and link it below um, and, and watch that okay then. so let's have a look at this question then so I need to work out x to the power 4 of this right now if you were expanding brackets to the sixth power, right, you know for a fact you are going to get an x to the power 6, something x to the power 6, and then you're going to get a, an x to the power 5, and you're going to get an x to the power 4, and an x to the power 3, and an x squared, and an x, and no x. Yeah? Because if you were expanding triple brackets, and you had an x inside those triple, uh, triple brackets, you're obviously going to get an x cubed, an x squared term, an x term, and no x. So we can already sort of put out the the um, sort of basic structure of what this is going to look like. Now, we're not actually raising x to the power 6, because our term, by the way, the binomial theorem, bi means two, nomial means terms. So it's about two terms in a bracket. Because the term is actually 2x, we're actually raising 2x to the power 6, and we're raising uh, 2x to the power 5, and we're raising 2x to the power 4, and 2x to the power 3, 2x squared, 2x, and 2x to the power 0, if you really want to think of it um, like that. Now, when you expand brackets, that's not all you get when you expand brackets, because remember, when you are uh, multiplying these terms, you also end up the other term also has to get involved. Now, like I said, I would highly recommend watching the other video because I'm just going to sort of gloss over it here. But basically, if I have descending powers of 2x, then the other term must have ascending powers. So, for example, in this one here, I must have an a to the power 0 as this coefficient, then a to the power 1, then a squared, then a to the power um, uh, 3, then a to the power 4, a to the power 5, and a to the power 6. Now that means that the powers must add to 6 because we're expanding uh, brackets to the power 6. Now the only one we're actually really bothered about here is this term because we're only after the x to the power 4 so really all the other terms don't actually matter for this question which is why it's only three marks it's not loads of work. So if I bring this this term down that I'm mostly interested in here I've got a squared brackets 2x to the power 4. Now let's expand these brackets. 
Um, so we get, well, 2 to the power 4 is 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, so that's going to be 16x to the power 4. So a squared, um, 16a squared um, x to the power 4, because you usually write the number first um, in algebra. Now, we are told that this is equal to 15,000. Now, some students might immediately just jump straight to that. However, we've missed a key step here in the binomial theorem. And like I said, I talk about it more in my video. But the binomial theorem also states that you can't just do this. You also have to multiply each of these terms by the number in Pascal's triangle. Now, again, if this means absolutely nothing to you, refer to that video where it explains more. I'm definitely flogging this video a lot. It's not the best video in the world, but it will definitely explain what I'm talking about here. So here is Pascal's triangle, um, and I need to go down to the sixth row. Now that's the zeroth row. So that's the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth row is gonna give you um, this, and then the sixth row is gonna be this. Now, in order to um, complete this question, you have to multiply every term by Pascal's triangle. So this term has to be multiplied by 1, because that's the first number in Pascal's triangle. This is multiplied by 6. This is multiplied by 15. This by 20. This by 15. This by 6. And this by 1. So we actually need to multiply this term by 15. And that's going to give us, well, 16 times 15 is... 240 so if I I can then say that um, this is equal to um, 240 a squared x to the power 4 and remember we we're told that the coefficient is 1500 so that implies that the thing in front of the x term 240 a squared must be equal to 1500 so you do 1500 divided by 240 that gives 6.25, so a squared is equal to 6.25, so a is equal to the square root of this, and that is 2.5. Now, they're saying there's two possible values, well that makes sense because when you square root a number, you're going to get two possible values, you're going to get the positive answer, 2.5, but also the negative answer. Right? Because if you square a negative, if you multiply by itself, you're going to get the positive um, and the outcome from that. So those are the two possible answers. So hopefully this makes some kind of sense. And like I said, binomial theorem is one of my favourite things in in maths. But for a lot of students that I for a lot of students that I teach, um, it's not um, sort of their favourite, or they they struggle to understand the concept initially. So Hopefully this video has made some kind of sense of that. But let's move on to the next question. Okay, so let's have a look at this. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H is a cube with sides of 32 centimetres. M, N are points on D, H and C, G respectively. Work out the size of the angle that the line M, uh, B, M makes with the plane A, B, C, D. Okay then, so first things first, let's... Um, add on some of this information then. So in this question where we want to find the angle that this line BM makes with the uh, plane ABCD. So I'm going to draw a sort of dotted line on here. We're looking for this angle here like the angle that sort of goes off the floor up right a 3D because uh, it's 3D trig in this in this case, a th sort of out 3D angle there. Now, the first thing we need to sort of work out in order to do this, what would be ideal is if we knew this side length here, and we knew this side length here, then we can use trigonometry to work out the angle. Okay, so with a big question like this, I'm already thinking it's five marks. So with a big question, I need to see what the answer is going to be, and sort of work backwards. So in this question, I need to work out this side length and this side length to work out this angle. Well, how am I going to work out these two sides? Well, I could work out this side here. Let's call this one um, x. Okay, I could work out x because I know that each side of this cube 
is 32 centimeters. So this side here must be 32 centimeters, and this side here must be 32 centimeters. And because it is a cube, every face meets at a right angle. So this is actually a right angle triangle. So I could use Pythagoras' theorem to work out what the length DB is, okay? Because Pythagoras' theorem states that, and again, I always like to write down the formula. So Pythagoras' theorem states that A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. So 32 squared plus 32 squared is equal to, and that is a calculator job. So 32 squared plus 32 squared is 2048. And so the square root of 2048 is equal to, I'm going to put 32 root 2 for now, um, but as a decimal, it's 45.254834. Uh, now I'm going to I'm going to sort of leave the third there for now because I, I want I don't want a rounding error by the time I get to my final answer. So I'm going to leave both uh, pieces working out here just in case I need to refer to that. But x is equal to that. Okay, so I've worked out one of the side lengths I need. Now I just need to work out the other side length. I need to work out this. Well, I know that this whole length here is 32. And if I can work out this length here, then I can take the wave for each other. Now, this length here is the same as this length here. And I can use basic trig to work this out because this side length is 32 because it's the same as this one up here. So this is 32. And that is an angle of 28. So I can use basic trigonometry because I've got the opposite side here, the adjacent side, and the hypotenuse, because we've got a right angle there. So I want the opposite side, let's call this y. I want the opposite side, um, and I have the adjacent, so I'm going to use tan. Tan of the angle is equal to the opposite divided by the adjacent. So tan of 28 is equal to the opposite, which I'm calling y, over... 32. So y is equal to 32 multiplied by tan of 28 by a little rearrangement there. So 32 times tan of 28 is going to give me 17. And I'm going to write down the whole display because obviously I don't want that rounding error. 17.0147081. Okay. Now, that is y. This length here but I want I'm gonna use a third color I want this length so how to work that out well I do 32 take away the thing I've just worked out because the whole length is 32 this bit here is the 17.01 blah de, blah de, blah so I take do 32 take away that and let's call this Z so this is letter Z Z is equal to uh, 14 Point nine eight five two nine eight one nine. Now we can finally actually work out this angle because I know x and I know z, so I can use trigonometry again. So let me just flick down one click. I'm going to use a different color again just to sort of make it stand out. So here I've got the adjacent side because this is the right angle here. I've got the adjacent to the to the angle. I've got the uh, the hypotenuse. I don't know, but I do know the opposite. So it's going to be tan again. Tan of the angle is equal to opposite divided by adjacent. So tan of the angle that I need to work out is equal to the opposite, which is the fourteen point nine eight five two nine eight one nine divided by the adjacent, which is that thirty two root two. Because I want to try and keep it as accurate as possible. So I need to do uh, that divided by uh, 32 root 2 and I get 0 0.3111 so tan of theta is equal to 0 0.33113143364. Now some students might sort of be like oh yeah it worked out the angle it's all hunky dory but that's tan of the angle. To work out the angle, you need to do 
inverse of tan. So shift tan on the calculator of that thing that you've just worked out. Dot dot dot. And that is going to give me shift tan 18.32 degrees. So theta is equal to an 18.3213306 degrees. Um, now, just looking back at the question, what would be an appropriate thing to be around this to? I mean, you could uh, arguably say 18 because they've used two. Uh, Two sig fig um, for the for the length, so maybe uh, rounding this to the nearest whole number might not be a um, might not be a bad shout. But um, yeah, I'm sure the mark scheme would accept any degree of accuracy here because they haven't really told us what degree of accuracy they want for this question. So hopefully that's offered a bit of uh, clarity on this question. It's not the it's not massively difficult if you know trigonometry it's understanding what bits you have to work out and what because this is a lot of working out but the actual maths itself well you've got Pythagoras' theorem trig and trig again so it's not necessarily a, a difficult mathematics for those that are on the that are doing the GCSE further maths i think what makes this question difficult is actually what do you need to work out and in what order okay so um yeah We'll, uh, we'll sort of leave it there. Again, like I said, I, 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 personally I would round this to one decimal place, but um, there's not really any, I don't think there'd be any critique here. I personally would round on the full calculated display first, then I'd do some subsequent rounding, just in case the, 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 the examiner can see that answer and say you've done it perfectly correctly, but you might have just rounded it differently to what the mark scheme is intended. Right then, let's move on to the final question for this part. So, so final question of this part then is going to be this question 18. So y is equal to uh, 12x plus 3 over x. Show that y has a minimum value when x is 0 0.5. Now, two things you kind of have to sort of prove here or show. So let's just take a random curve. Let's say it's like a, an x uh, cubed curve. I'm going to change back to a lot of pen. x cubed uh, curve here. Right, so it's going to look something like this. Right. You know, there might be some other terms in there, but that's the basic shape of an x cubed term. You, to prove that it has a minimum value, you kind of have to prove two things. One is you have to prove it is a stationary point, right? That means that in this example here, this is a stationary point because this is a part of the, of the curve where the gradient is zero, right? And this here is a stationary point. Well, uh, it's because it's the part of the curve that is zero. So that's the first thing you have to prove is that at that point the gradient is zero. So that's the first condition. So you have to pr prove that it is a stationary point by proving that the gradient is equal to zero at that point. The second thing you have to prove, to prove that it's a minimum value, you have to show that it's, in this example, we call this a local minimum because it's not the minimum value of the whole curve because obviously this part is lower but this is a local minimum because it's the stationary point that's at its lowest value um, and it's a like a concave shape like this is like a bowl shape whereas this is a like a hill shape so to prove something is a minimum value you have to prove that prove that um, it's going to be sort of this that the stationary point in question that you've brought up is like this ball shape and to do that you need to prove that the second derivative d2y by dx squared the second derivative right is greater than zero right? if it's greater than zero it means it's a minimum if it's less than zero it means it's a maximum which i know is very confusing but um, that is just how mathematics works so those are kind of the two things we have to prove so first thing let's prove that when x is 0 0.5 this is a stationary point that's the first condition we have to fulfill so if you've got a function here you well to find the gradient at a point of a function you need to take um, the derivative you need to differentiate it so let me just rewrite this in terms of powers of x so it would look something like this because when you uh, have 3 over x it's x to the power of minus 1 
Now, when you differentiate this, we get 12, because when you differentiate something that's just x, the x to speak, because it's 1 times 12 take away 1 off the power, so you get 12, plus uh, minus 3, because 3 times minus 1 is minus 3, x to the minus 2. And uh, let me just rewrite that. Adding a negative is the same as subtraction, so it would look something like this. Now, when x is equal to 0 0.5, let me just scroll down. When x is equal to 0 0.5, then 12 take away 3 times 0 0.5 to the power of negative 2. Well, that would be a calculator job. So 12 take away 3 times 0 0.5 to the power of negative 2. 2 um, and that gives 0. Now I might be tempted here just to sort of show a little bit of working out um, and put something looking like um, this is equal to 0. So therefore, I mean we were expecting this because we've just subbed it in it's telling us the gradient is 0 and we were expecting that because it's asked us to show it's uh, a stationary point and we knew the gradient was going to be 0. So therefore um, when x is equal to 0 0.5, it is a stationary point. Okay, the next thing that we have to prove is that it is a minimum. So to do that we need to take the second derivative, so we need to differentiate the thing that we've already differentiated. So the second derivative, d2y by dx squared, is going to be, well that 12 is going to disappear. And then negative 3 times negative 2 is positive 6, x to the minus 3. When x is equal to 0 0.5, so we're going to do 6 times 0 0.5 to the power of negative 3. And again, that's going to be a calculator job. So 6 times 0 0.5 to the power of negative 3. And that's going to give us 48, which is greater than 0. Right? And as I explained earlier, if the second derivative is greater than zero, then it is a minimum. So this is greater than zero, so therefore the stationary point is a minimum value. As shown, right? And that's what they exactly what they've um, asked us to do in the question. So a nice sort of little question here about differentiating but differentiating twice, things to do with stationary points, all that kind of stuff uh, coming together. The only sort of really, uh, well, the things that I would think are going to be sort of tripping hazards, firstly is just realising that 3 over x can be written as 3x uh, to the power of negative 1, so therefore you can differentiate it. And also just the problem with the negatives, things like that, subbing in, um, and also, I can imagine a lot of students will jump straight to point number two without really explicitly showing point number one, right? You can't really show something is a minimum value if you haven't first shown it's a stationary point. The reason why is because, for example, you could sub something in, but actually the graph has a lower value than that, right? And you've shown, oh yeah, it would be um, it, it sort of you know, works with this d2y by dx squared is greater than zero. But if you haven't shown it's a stationary point, then it doesn't really have much meaning. So you have to do step one before you do step two. Go show anything's a stationary point, then show that it has a minimum value. So I'll wrap it up here for this part then. This part's probably a little bit longer than the other ones, just because we've had so many uh, five mark questions, long questions in this part. So if there are any uh, questions or concerns you might have, then please feel free to drop them in the comments below. I'd be more than happy to answer those, those questions. So all there is to say really is I hope you've enjoyed this video and I hope you have a fantastic day.